Thanks so much for the intro, Remy. Um, so I have two important things to say before I actually start my talk. The first one is, wow, what a day. What impressive talks and what a fantastic event. This is why I want to say a very big, big thank you to Remy and Julie and all the volunteers who helped put up this event and make, made it such an amazing thing that it was. And if you agree, please give a big round of applause to them. So yeah, Remy, Julie, this was for you. The second thing is what Remy also mentioned already. Um, I want to give a trigger warning for this talk. Um, this talk covers racism, sexism, abuse, harassment, and rape and death threats. My name is Lena Reinhardt, and I'm at LRNRD on Twitter. I've been working in tech for six years now. In this time, I've been leading marketing operations and software development teams at different companies and startups, and I've contributed to the open source projects Hoodie and CoachDB. And I've also co-founded The Neighbor Hoodie, a software and product development company. Have you ever been to a forest? Like in autumn, right now, when the air is fresh and a little cold? Have you felt the softness of the ground, heard the sound of breaking branches under your feet, and have you smelled the scent of the forest? And have you ever stood under a tree, looked above you, and got overwhelmed by its majesty? Trees have been in existence for 370 million, million years. There were over three trillion mature trees in the world. That's roughly 400 trees per person. Trees are essential for the cycling of nutrients, for water and air quality, and they play a main role in moderating the climate on Earth. But trees aren't indestructible. The number of trees on Earth has halved since humans, humans started agriculture 12,000 years ago. But humans are not the only danger to trees. One of their most common health problems are root problems. Root problems can cause a tree to die. And unhealthy, dying trees can become a big hazard. They can fall on power lines, houses, cars, or even on humans, and can cause much harm. This is why it's so important to check if an unhealthy, dying tree should be kept, or rather be cropped, so that the danger that it brings can be eliminated and the growth of new trees around it can be ensured. The technology industry is a tree that is rotting from its roots. This is a talk about everything, a talk about everything that's broken. Technology is shaping our daily lives. Around 3.2 billion people worldwide have internet access right now. That's around 40% of the world population. In the UK, people spend an average of four hours and 23 minutes every day looking at a computer, smartphone, or tablet screen. In Indonesia, the country with the most daily screen time worldwide, it's almost seven hours. Humans globally spend an average of one hour and 43 minutes on social networking sites like Facebook and 48 minutes on microblogging sites like Twitter. Technology can even change how our brains work. Studies found that playing computer games can lead to brain growth in the areas that are involved in navigation and motor control. They also showed that pensioners could improve their working memory and attention span through playing games. Technology is the power to change the world, but how are we using this power? Conway's law says that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of their own communication structures. This means all systems that we design become a copy of the thoughts, biases, stereotypes, and other traits of the people who are designing and working on them. Copies of their very own capabilities and limitations. Design processes are problem-solving processes. And the question is, whose problems we can and want to solve? Of the complete world population, only around 0.25% are software developers. That's only 18 million people in total, including, including hobbyists who don't code professionally. This also means for every software developer out there and here, there are many, many people who don't code. 
These are the people that we mostly build our software for. We build software for users. This means that building software is an act of representation. And this representation role leads to responsibility. In order to understand this responsibility, we first need to look at ourselves. We live in societies in which power is unevenly distributed. Some of us can exist in the society with ease, gain influence, and are accepted without scrutiny or suspicion, which gives us advantages relative to other groups. This means that we have privilege. Privilege comes from various factors, like gender, race, socioeconomic or educational background, intergenerational wealth, ability, appearance, physical and mental health, and many more. Take me, for example. I pass as a cissexual or cis woman, which means that my experience of my own gender matches the sex I was assigned at birth. I'm white. I was born into a middle class family and received education. I'm also able-bodied, and my weight and height are within the boundaries of what is socially considered acceptable. And this list is not even exhaustive. This is my privilege, which I recognize and try to act according to. And my privilege also sets limitations for my actions. Privilege is a shield that protects us from problems, and it blocks parts of our perceptions. Creativity, on the other hand, is a driver of good design and engineering. It is the ability to see connections where others have not, and it depends on our life experiences. This is why understanding our own privileges is the first step to understanding our responsibility as people who are designing and building software. Pete Warden once wrote, when I'm optimizing code, my intuition about which parts are slowest is often wildly wrong. So I've learned the hard way that I have to profile the hell out of it before I try to fix anything. It's a core skill for dealing with computers. Our gut feelings often don't work. So skepticism becomes a habit. We leave that habit behind when confronted with evidence about ourselves. Let's talk about some evidence about ourselves. Just start by thinking about the tech company that you're working at. When you're walking along the hallway in your office, how often do you meet a woman of color, a trans person or a person with a disability, a person who's older than 40 years? How often do you have lunch with someone who's not a white cis man? There are only one to 3% black or African American people working at major tech companies like Facebook, Google, Yahoo, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Last year, Twitter was used by more than 20% of African Americans and Hispanic Americans. But only 3% of Twitter's engineering and product staff are African American or Hispanic, as Leslie Miley recently pointed out. Many talented gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, intersexual, and trans people are working in tech but there are not even numbers on how many or few they are. 90 to 99% of contributors to free and open source software projects are white, cis men. Fewer and fewer women are getting computer science degrees and working as engineers. 77 to 87% of leadership roles in tech go to men, and 79% of leadership is white. And 41% of women leave careers in technology after 10 years, more than twice the number of men. Despite all these numbers, still too many of us fail to even acknowledge that the technology industry has an enormous problem. A bit more than one year ago, Gamergate took off, a sustained, coordinated harassment campaign which seeks to drive women out of computing. But it's not only Gamergate. Many women of color, people of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, intersectional, trans, queer people, and women in the tech industry have been experiencing harassment, threats, abuse, and constant microaggressions on a daily basis for years. Ash Wang, <coughs> sorry, Ash Wang recently wrote the following about being a woman who happens to tech. 
of which I quote an excerpt here. Being a woman who happens to tech is another shirt in my closet that I'll never wear because it doesn't fit and won't throw out because that feels wrong. It's going online in the midst of some battle about being allowed to be a woman, being allowed to take up space in this industry, going, nope, not today, and watching old episodes of Alias instead. It's eating with a room full of men talking about how thankful they are that their wives stay home and take care of the kids while they build the future. It's being told at interviews that they thought I'd be a man based on my work. At every step along their way, underrepresented people in tech are told that they don't belong here. At every step along their way, they're objectified, dismissed, and harassed, and have to fight for their sheer existence in this industry. And at every step along their way, they see how known harassers, abusers, and sexist people keep on getting platforms. And this whole system is rigged. Main parts of our work in tech depend on our ability to work with people in the broader tech community, the same community which is usually responsible for harassment. Thus, people who are facing harassment have to choose between either putting their career at risk or somehow trying to live with constant abuse. Harassment also means that people who are facing it can't spend their time, physical and emotional energy on improving their skills. This way, the gap between privileged and underrepresented people in tech is actively maintained and even widened through harassment. Thing is, many of us only hear about this harassment online or from acquaintances, or we don't even hear about it at all. Gamergate, daily harassment and microaggressions are happening in a very remote place for us. <clears throat> we ourselves praise the tech community. We're glad to be part of this community, and we ask people to appreciate and give back to it. Meanwhile, many of us are in a position to forget that this same community is also something that's burning some people's lives to the ground. And this is what privilege really means. Privilege means that we have a choice whether or not we deal with oppression. What leads to a daily struggle for many people is no problem for many of us. We have the privilege not to listen, not to care, to ignore, and to do nothing. This is privilege, the luxury to ignore and not care about the experiences of underrepresented groups in this industry. A luxury that no member of an underrepresented group in tech has. The tech industry and startup world are built on privilege. And the main issues that this includes are the uneven wealth distribution and flow of money. One example only are the huge pay gaps, which mean that men are earning more money for the same jobs than women, women of color, or people of color do. Clichés also say that entrepreneurs have a special risk appetite or gene for risks, but in fact, the most common shared trade amongst company founders is access to money. Money from their families, an inheritance, or connections that give them access to financial stability, which then allow them to take the risk of starting their own company. This is why an overwhelming number of founders are white men. On top of that, 94% of venture capitalists are male and mostly white. Thus, overproportionately more white men are in a position to make funding decisions. This leads to results like this one. Between 2011 and 2013, of the companies that received venture funding in the US, less than 10% had women CEOs, and only 1% was founded by an African American. In short, people don't even have access to the resources to plant their own trees. And in the end, all of this comes down to questions of power. As Dr. Wade Noble said, power is the ability to define reality and convince other people that it is their definition. Power lies in all we do every day. Power is whose voices are heard, who gets how much money for their work, who has access to funding and venture capital, 
and power is also about who does not get harassed. These and many more are signs of power, and privilege comes with power. Those with the most privilege and the most power in the tech industry are cis white men, and in most cases, they still are in power. So, where are we now? Where have this lack of diversity in technology, the privilege, the unequal distribution of power, and the broken communities led us? The software we built just ignores vast parts of our user base. Like Apple that released a health application in which you can track anything aside from menstruation. Or like so many of our tools that ask people about their gender but only offer binary gender options, male and female, ignoring everyone with a different gender. Our software is sexist. Often, unset or default avatars in our tools show men. The same goes for the placeholders in our forms. Even if we're using a name like John Doe that seems to be generic, it's still a man's name. If the default or unset states in our software read as men, we're making an implicit statement that our normal user is a man and everyone else is just an exception. Our software also undermines people's right to make their own choices. Many software rollouts opt users into new features automatically. This is especially problematic for people who are less technical and for users from marginalized communities who are the most likely to be endangered by violations of their privacy. Our software is also enabling and allowing abuse. Major tech companies like Facebook keep on repeating that they're only providing neutral platforms for users to communicate with each other. For months, hundreds of Facebook users have been writing hate speech against refugees and asylum seekers in Germany. And despite reports, almost none of these hateful, racist, violent posts were deleted by Facebook. While, on the other hand, supposed trademark violations, copyright violations, or a visible woman's nipple have often been enough to get content or users removed from the site. The same goes for most widely used platforms. As at Sugar High Five Me wrote, Twitter is faster at suspending accounts that post GIFs of major league baseball playoffs than accounts that engage in rape and death threats. Hate speech is not only morally unacceptable, but even considered a crime under most jurisdictions. Right now, our software is allowing abuse, and our companies are even making profit from it. Our software is also asking way too much information from its users. Our software is ignoring users' requests to not track them on their way across the entire internet. The tools we have built are persistently and pervasively violating the boundaries of our users, and there's not much they can do about it. We have established a state in which users' consent is routinely violated, and in which these violations are normalized into invisibility. Lots of free and open source software projects praise themselves for providing alternatives to proprietary software for users. But most open source software is hard to impossible to use for most people. And tools for privacy preservation like the Tor browser or email encryption are not accessible for less technical people at all. Right now, our open source software is not providing anything meaningfully better than many proprietary tools. The software we have built has even become a direct enabler for harassment. Only one example is Twitter's feature for sponsored tweets and ads. This feature has enabled racists, fascists, and white supremacists to get their abusive tweets promoted directly into the timeline of women and ethnic minorities, while Twitter profited from the harassment again. And our software is actively endangering people. Tech companies are still reinforcing so-called real name policies, meaning that they require users to use their legal name on the site. The idea behind such policies was to reduce harassment, but just the opposite has happened. These policies are actively harming endangered groups. The cost of these policies includes harassment, discrimination, rape and death threats, physical danger, and much more. Just one week ago, Facebook now announced that they're changing the policy on their site. 
But this step comes far too late for far too many people. Another point is what Re Eleanor Saita recently pointed out in a talk on security design. She said 50% of the women who enter a women's shelter have malware on their device. This is what a high-risk user looks like. And on a regular basis, we also expose users to dangers through security flaws. And we have built tools that have enabled personal data to be exposed online. The software we are building is even actively making people sick. Like people with temporary or chronic vestibular disorders who make up around one third of people aged 40 and above. People with those conditions usually suffer reactions like dizziness or panic attacks to animations. Animations that form an important part of many operating systems nowadays, as Greg Tarnoff recently wrote. Software has also helped diesel cars from Volkswagen and probably other car manufacturers emit more pollution on the road than in regulatory tests. This nitrogen oxide or NOx pollution is contributing to lung diseases, heart diseases, and cancer. According to recent studies, this additional NOx pollution is believed to have caused hundreds of premature deaths and billions of dollars in health costs. This is what software has done. This is what we have done. This is the status of technology. We are some of the most powerful and privileged people in this world. And we have been focusing on self-catering, self-centered solutions to our very own problems. And we have written software that actively endangers and harms humans. And this bad software is only a symptom of the status of the tech industry, a status which can only be described as a systems failure, a failure of its structures, its processes, and of the humans behind it, a failure of the ones in power. Our industry and the software that we're building are a perfect reflection of the systemic inequalities and injustice in our societies. And what we need now are deep systemic changes in this industry. But we as humans usually don't like change. We often believe that when we've been doing something in a particular way for some time, it must be a good way to do things. Our bias against change has been shown in several studies. Just take a tree again. When a tree was described as 4,500 years old, people admired its appearance. They admired its appearance way more than when the same tree was described as only 500 years old. Change also means more work and change can hurt. Change means we have to give up things that we, we thought we knew, our old assumptions, ideas, ideals, and plans. Change in technology means that the people dominating the tech industry right now will have to give up their power. This change is necessary, and the future of technology depends on it. Each and every one of us plays a part in determining the future of technology. The software we build is a representation of the humans behind it. Every design and every single line of code are a political and ethical decision. Our algorithms are built with values. Our technology is not neutral. There is no chance for us humans to be neutral. This is why it's time for us to take a stand. We need to publicly and actively stand against the nastiness inherent in the tech industry today. And the more privileged we are, the more it is our responsibility to do this. If we don't actively support change, we are complicit in enabling the current tox toxic, broken system. So what can we do in our daily lives to help redistribute power and support change in the technology industry? These are 10 things that we need to do to make the technology industry a better place for everyone. First, we need to develop empathy. Empathy is the ability to relate to another person as though they could be us. It helps us feel and understand the emotions, circumstances, thoughts, and needs of the humans around us. 
As people working on software, empathy is our responsibility. We need to actively work on actually caring about other people, as Marco Rogers once called it. Empathy also means that we need to build egalitarian and empathetic systems architectures. We need to provide users with accessible products and platforms which value enthusiastic consent. We need to give our users tools to restore their ability to set and enforce their own boundaries. In order to deal with information, our brains create shortcuts and use past knowledge, experiences, and cultural norms to make assumptions. This is called unconscious bias. We all have these biases, and they cause us to misjudge people or situations like the following. When investors heard entrepreneurial pitches coming from men and from women, they preferred ventures twice as often when they were pitched by a man. They also rated pitches narrated by men as more persuasive, logical, and fact-based than when the same pitch was narrated by a woman. Job candidates with names that didn't sound stereotypically African-American received 50% more callbacks than those with African-American sounding names. In reviews of high performers in tech, negative personality criticism was seen in 85% of reviews for women and only 2% of reviews for men. One more example was pointed out by Rachel Thomas. She wrote, a study from Yale researchers shows that perceiving yourself as objective is actually correlated with showing even more bias. The mere desire to not be biased is not enough to overcome decades of cultural conditioning. This means that we really need to become aware of our biases and we need to actively work through them. We need to know our own history and educate ourselves. We need to understand social justice, inequality, and systemic oppression. We need to understand how our own position and identity have been shaped in terms of privilege and race. We need to understand the culture and society we live in and in which ways we benefit from the existing system around us. And it's our very own responsibility to educate ourselves. We must never expect underrepresented people in this industry to educate us. Diversity is often described as a state of having many different forms, types, and ideas, which is a good description, but there's one problem with it. As humans, we often don't properly understand diversity, and our perceptions of diversity are off. Studies showed that we have a gender perception gap. Men consistently perceive more gender parity than women do. If there is 17% women in any given group, men think it's 50% women and 50% men. And with 33% women, the men think that there are more women than men in the group. The situation is even worse when it comes to race. Another study showed that African Americans felt that integration meant a 50-50 ratio of black and white people in their neighborhood, while white people thought that a 50-50 ratio was already far too high for them to feel comfortable. The perception of diversity by people with privilege is off, and it's far off the actual numbers. They already feel that diversity is overachieved and even feel uncomfortable, even when numbers show that the comp composition of groups is still far from equal. The thing about diversity is we already live in societies that are diverse but the technology industry continues to be a mostly homogeneous space. Diversity is good and it's important. Diverse teams are more productive, more effective, they build better products and help increase profits. Organizations also benefit from diversity work from a moral standpoint, since it just makes them look pretty good to have a diverse team behind them. But, but the organizations that diverse teams work for are still mostly owned and run by white men, who are then benefiting from diversity financially and morally again. But diversity is a political issue that is about the systems we exist in, 
Diversity is an issue of basic human rights. This is why we must not tie diversity to its economical and moral benefits. Erica Baker recently wrote about which diversity work is currently prioritized in corporate diversity work. Baker wrote about the message that many Silicon Valley companies have been saying with their money. And the message is, people of color get in line and wait for women and white women to get theirs, then we'll get to you. White women like me are currently benefiting from diversity work overproportionately, especially from corporate diversity work. Even the term increased diversity itself is still often used as a synonym of more white women, which have become the poster child for diversity in tech. But diversity is not a goal that is achieved when the workforce at our tech companies is 50% white women. Diversity work means far more than aiming for 50% white women speaking at our events. Kimberly Crenshaw wrote, we simply do not have the luxury of building social movements that are not intersectional. We need to work on intersectionality, the awareness that different people face different forms of oppression and discrimination on more than one level. Diversity in tech means that we need to include a broad range of people. Yes, we need to work on getting and keeping more women in tech. But at the same time, we need to include women of color, trans women of color, lesbian, bisexual, and gay people, people with disabilities, people with physical or mental illnesses, people who have to do care work, trans people, people of color, older people, and more. This is the diversity that we need to work on right now. This is the diversity that companies need to give their money to. And this is the inclusion that we need to work on. We need to provide good and safe spaces for these people so they can actually stay and thrive in this industry. We also need to shut up. Our voices, the voices of people with most power and privilege, have been heard most and through all history. We need to stop shouting over the voices of underrepresented people in tech and stop, step back from the idea that our voices always need to be heard. As Lee Alexander wrote in a post on sexism, it is totally and entirely possible that you might have nothing to add and you could benefit from the conversations of those who do. This includes that we have to listen to what underrepresented people in tech have to say. Follow them on Twitter, read their blogs and publications and use our outreach to amplify their voices. Listening is a process of actively looking for the voices of those that we didn't hear before. It requires looking beyond our own existing networks. Listening also means that every one of us is responsible for keeping our eyes and ears open in our communities. We need to call out and re report toxic behavior and stand by the people who are affected by it. We also need to give. Give our knowledge, technical skills, time and money to groups or individuals in this industry who are in need of support. But we're also humans who are part of societies. Thus, we also need to help make our communities and societies better for everyone. We can do so by giving our time and money on culture, arts, charity, or for example, to the organizations supporting the refugees that are coming to many countries in Europe right now. There are many things that we can also do as founders or members of companies and organizations. First of all, we need to formalize our work instead of going for our gut feelings, especially when it comes to hiring, promotions, and other HR decisions. We need companies that make their leaders accountable for diversity in their teams. We need to train managers and teams in recognizing and combating their biases, and we need diverse leadership to begin with. We need companies that are founded and funded by heterogeneous groups of people. And we need companies that build safe, inclusive spaces in which diverse teams can exist and thrive. We need spaces in which people feel that they belong. Acknowledging our privilege is not enough. 
We need to take steps to work through it, give up on our power, and use our privilege for good. This also means that we need to be willing to step aside. These were the first nine things we need to do. We need to develop empathy, work through our biases, educate ourselves, understand diversity, shut up, listen to, and amplify the voices of underrepresented people in tech, formalize our work, and use our privilege for good. And each of us needs to work on being an ally constantly by following these steps before. And our work on being an ally needs to be constant. There is no opt out of oppression. And if we want to be allies, we have to keep in mind that there is no opt out of ally work either. This is what we need to do. And we need to do it now. Software increasingly defines the world around us. It's rewriting everything about human interaction. And it's systems built by the privileged for the privileged, with disastrous consequences for everyone else. 50, 40, 30 years, even 10 years from now, most of the software that we work on today will be way outdated. There will be new programming languages, new frameworks, new tools, or something beyond that that we can't even imagine yet. What we're building now will soon be history. And the question is, who do we all want to be? And what do we want to be our legacy? The technology industry is a tree that is rotting from its roots. What we need now are deep changes. Together, we can change this industry. Together, we can help people plant their own trees. And together, we can build a better future for the tech industry, a future that is about justice. We all play a role in setting the standards for our communities. We all play a part in raising the standards in our industry. We need to help redistribute power in technology. We need to make technology a place for everyone so that we can build technology for everyone. And so that we can make things right to the people who we've treated so wrongfully. Now is the time for us to put our foot down and demand the change that we want to see. Now is the time for us to be the change that we want to see. Our technology is political. Our technology cannot be neutral. It's time that each and every one of us, with every design, with every line of code, with every action, takes a stand because everything matters. Thank you.